Matthew 12, 1 to 14. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus and his disciples breaking the Sabbath. Though I should mention and make clear that since Jesus fulfilled God's law that came through Moses perfectly, he never broke that law, that means he never broke any of the Sabbath laws. However, that's not how the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day saw it. Because Jesus and his disciples in this passage that we're going to read broke the Sabbath traditions, the rules that the Jews themselves had added on to the law. Now, the point of the Sabbath is that it is a day of rest, right? A day where you're not supposed to work. In fact, in that law of Moses, God's law to Israel, that's a command, right? It's even one of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. So it's more than just a suggestion, right? It's a command to the Israelite people. If you didn't keep the Sabbath day, if you didn't keep it holy, if you did work on that day, then you would have broken God's law. Now, as Gentiles, whoever is not a Jew is a Gentile, as Gentiles, we're not under that Mosaic law, right? That law that was for, you know, Israel, right? It was for the Israelite people, the Jewish people, right? That was what they needed to hold to. We are not under that law, but as we're looking at today's passage in Matthew 12, Jesus is a Jew. His disciples are Jews. The Pharisees are Jews. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to give you insight into what they were commanded to follow as we dive into this passage Matthew 12, 1 to 14. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So... It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. So God, as we enter your word today, I just pray that... uh, You would be with each one of us, that you would give us understanding of your word, and that you would be with me, because I know I can get things wrong. I know that maybe I haven't sometimes interpreted your word uh, right, but I just pray that today, if that happened to be the case, Lord, that you would not let that be believed. If I say anything wrong or untrue, Do not let that be believed in the name of Jesus. But give us understanding of your truth in the name of Jesus. I know there's going to be some challenging things that are brought up in here. But I also 
want to do your word justice. I don't want to shy away from what you have said in your word, what you have commanded in your word. And so I just, I don't want to do that. And so I just pray that your word this morning would be taken to heart, that it would be understood, and that your truth in that word would be believed in the name of Jesus. This is about you. This is about giving you glory, giving you honor. And this is about learning about what you have said and who you are. And so I just pray that that would be the case in this time. You're the main, you're the main one. You're the big deal. And so I just pray that our focus would be on you in this time. And just that you would, again, give us understanding of your word and your truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Lying is sinful. God hates it when we lie. In Proverbs 6, we read that there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Twice it brings up lies. The Lord hates it when we lie. We should be honest people, right? We should be people of the truth. But does that mean that there is absolutely no circumstance in which lying is okay? The famous example in recent history is of Corey Ten Boom, and I'll read an article um, that was from gotquestions.org, which, as the name suggests, it asks a question. It says, the question then remains, is there ever a time when lying is the right thing to do? The most common illustration of this dilemma comes from the life of Corey Ten Boom in Nazi-occupied Holland. Essentially, the story is this. Corrie Ten Boom is hiding Jews in her home to protect them from the Nazis. Nazi, Nazi soldiers come to her home and ask her if she knows where any Jews are hiding. What is she to do? Should she tell the truth and allow the Nazis to capture the Jews she was trying to protect? Or should she lie and deny that she knows anything about them. Well, we actually have a very similar Bible story to this about hiding Jews. Uh, a lot of you probably know it. Uh, it's about the Israelite spies in Jericho sent by the famous Joshua. Chapter 2 of his book tells us, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Eventually, the spies, they escaped by a rope out of her window as she lived right in the city wall, and they returned to safety. So she saved them, right? The point, of course, though, in all of this, the main thing we see is she lied to the men the king had sent to find the Israelite spies, right? She 
lied. Now, it's not uncommon for the Bible to have stories where you're not sure if the person actually did the right thing or not. Uh, if you're just reading this chunk of scripture, you don't actually even get a clear answer of whether it was actually justified that she lied or not. As you keep reading, though, you see that the Lord spares her and her family when Jericho is overthrown. So she is rewarded. And to reinforce that, she is commended for what she did in the Hall of Faith, which is what Hebrews 11 is commonly called. So there it says, By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies, as in she welcomed them in peace. She didn't give them over to their enemy. So sure, I mean, you could say, you know, this is not a passage that says without a shadow of a doubt that it was good that she lied. But in view of the entirety of what Rahab did in hiding them and in helping them escape, the word of God here says that that was an act of great faith. So what Rahab did was counted by God as doing good. So, is there ever a time when lying is the right thing to do? I would say that we've just seen a couple of examples, a couple of situations where being completely honest would have been the wrong thing to do. Sure, maybe there's, you know, maybe some clever way to tell the truth. Jews that were hidden at Corey Ten Boom's house were in a room under the floorboards, under a rug, under the dining room table, so her sister could truthfully say they're under the table and get away with seeming a little bit not all there when Nazis looked at the table and saw the empty space underneath it, right? That's a rare opportunity, though. Like, what was Rahab? If you think of Rahab, what was she supposed to do in her situation? She was commanded, bring out the men who have come to you, who have come to you. They know where they are, who have entered your house, right? What's she going to do? Say no and have them just push past and get the men anyway? Sometimes, and I would say very, very rarely still, there can be an exception to the rule of do not lie. But again, the circumstances are rare. The rule still is do not lie, right? But don't stick to that rule to the point where innocent people are being killed. We even just read, you know, what does the Lord hate? Hands that shed innocent blood. Don't stick to that rule to the point where innocent people are being killed. Rules in Scripture, rules in Scripture are meant to be followed, for sure, but not to a fault. And though the situation in this Matthew passage isn't about not telling lies, instead it's about not working on the Sabbath, we still see that the Pharisees in Jesus' day follow that rule to a fault, and great is that fault. It actually makes me really upset when, when, when we actually get to that second half of the story. It shows how heartless and blind they are. This first part, however, is a lot more understandable and is more just about how it isn't really right of them to take away the gray area of the command. You see, the Jewish authorities, again, they added their own laws on top of the law of Moses, God's law, in order that they would not even come close to breaking God's law. So they had laws preventing them from even getting close to breaking God's laws. Now, in some ways, that can be commendable, right? Setting boundaries that help you keep away from sinning can be a good thing. For example, sometimes we can think of maybe roommates. Roommates, right? Is it a sin for two unrelated, unmarried people of the opposite sex to live in the same house? No, it's not. But what is a sin is fornication, which can easily happen in those kinds of situations. And if the two are in a relationship, that's almost certainly what's happening. So even though it's not a command, wisdom says, maybe let's set a boundary not to live in the same house. These are good rules, right? There are good rules. 
to make for yourself, to keep you from sinning, to help you, right? To help you. Because what we see with these traditional Jewish laws is that they don't help. They do more harm than help. They actually become burdensome. So let's again read the example here in Matthew 12. It says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat it. So they pluck a head of grain, they, they rub it in their hands to get the chaff and some of the other stuff off, and then they eat, right? They just eat. So would that be doing work on the Sabbath? Like, for instance, let's say, you know, someone has a day off and they decide, I'm not going to do any work at all, right? No work. I'm not doing any work today at all. And so they get up and they go over to the kitchen and they grab their bundle of bananas and they tear off a banana from the bundle and they peel the banana to eat it. Did they go against what they said they were going to do when they said they weren't going to do any work? No. No. If you get extremely, extremely technical, then yes, you're doing some kind of work in some way. But if someone were to ask you, you know, did you do any work today? In that situation, the answer is obviously no, right? You wouldn't say that. You didn't do work today. You peeled a banana. The disciples are not out there, you know, with with sickles, cutting all this grain like a farmer would be doing as his job, as his work. No, they've just plucked some heads of grain to eat while passing through the grain fields. But to the Pharisees, according to their traditions, that's still technically harvesting, still technically threshing. Therefore, they did work. It says, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He, Jesus, said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. This example actually, again, supports that point very much about there being exceptions to the rule, because in this situation, if you know the context, if you know the story, David was fleeing for his life. Saul, the king of Israel, was chasing him down, trying to kill him. And David came across the house of God where all the priests were as he was starving. So the idea is, of course, these priests are not, they're not going to let him starve. The circumstance meant an exception to the rule. And then Jesus asks another question. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? The priests, according to God's law, did have to do some work on the Sabbath, which these Pharisees, they would have known. Yeah, it's okay for the the priests to do that. Jesus says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would would not have condemned the guiltless. And actually right there, he even declares his disciples to be guiltless in breaking the Sabbath. Right? They're not breaking the Sabbath. Jesus says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. There is this, of course, gray area in You know, what counts as doing work, right? What actually counts? Does this count? You know, I'm not working, so does this count? Just picking some grain for myself to eat right away? The Pharisees say yes, because even that counts to them as harvesting and threshing, right? But Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is God. Who knows better than Jesus what's allowed on the Sabbath? Nobody knows better. So, of course, if Jesus disagrees with the Pharisees, the Pharisees are wrong. The Pharisees are missing 
the heart of what the Sabbath means. Just like they're missing the heart behind God's law in general. The example Jesus gives here is I desire mercy, not sacrifice, which goes hand in hand with what the book of Mark also records him saying at this time. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This isn't about the rule that you you have to bend to its will. No, the Sabbath was a command, yes, but the Sabbath was a gift, right? It was a gift. The Sabbath was made for man. It was meant for the good of mankind, you know, a day of rest. It was never meant to be a burden with 30 extra laws attached to it to make it more difficult. No, it was supposed to be a day of rest. Take a break from your toil. Take a day from your work every week. But the Jewish authorities turned it into a burden, an unneeded burden. It's so fitting, too, that last week we talked about how Jesus relieves people of their burdens only to turn the page, go to the next chapter, and we're reading about the Pharisees adding burdens to people. The Pharisees are missing the heart of what the Sabbath means. And as we move on, it gets worse. The Pharisees then take the Sabbath and try to use it to their advantage against Jesus. And I'll, I'll start by reading Mark's account, and I find this awful. I, I do not like this at all. Mark 3, 1 to 2. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus. They know this guy's there with his withered hand. They know he needs help. They watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Okay, so they want to catch Jesus. Okay, they want to see him break the Sabbath tradition again to accuse him, to get a good shot in. But what will they get after him about? Healing a man's withered hand? This shows undeniably that the Pharisees cared more about the rules than they did about People, this man has been troubled by this withered hand for who knows how long, and they don't think, oh, this man is getting help. Good. They think, wow, I hope Jesus heals this man so we can catch Jesus in the act of breaking the Sabbath. It's horrible. And, and it, it shows not only their heartlessness, but actually this also shows their blindness because this miracle also points to Jesus being the Messiah. Again, Jesus is doing miracles, and again, they refuse to believe that he is the Christ. These Pharisees are heartless and blind. Heartless and blind. Consumed so much with keeping the law that they end up breaking the two most important laws of all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Pharisees, where is the love? The most important part of all the law that they so cherish, that they so strive to keep, they place their own man-made traditions above it heartless, and blind. Looking back at Matthew's account in verse 9 here, uh, it starts by saying he went on from there, so from back where they had been picking grain, and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, so that much we did read in Mark. But then the Pharisees, who have been scheming, as we talked about, they then asked their question to Jesus. It says, and they asked him, is it lawful? to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Again, we see that theme 
of there being exceptions to the rule based on loving others. You know, you're not just going to leave your sheep who fell into a pit just because it's a Sabbath. No, you're going to go help it, even if it takes work, right? Even if it takes work to get that sheep out of there, you are going to help that sheep. So Jesus says, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? This is a person, right? This man needed help. This man needed healing. I'm not going to refrain from healing him just because it's the Sabbath. So he says, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. We find out in Mark that Jesus was grieved as well. He was grieved, and of course he would be. He was grieved by these Pharisees, by how hard their hearts were. He was looking at them with anger. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against Jesus and how to destroy him. He's like, oh, look, this, this man, he performed a miracle that, you know, if, if we were thinking straight, we would have seen that he was, we would have understood that he was the Messiah. So let's kill him. It's really bad. It's almost laughable how bad these Pharisees are, not realizing that they're, they're breaking their most important laws, the laws of love, right? Elevating the tradition above the person. It's so, so bad. This is leadership that's supposed to be holy, right? That's supposed to be bringing the Lord glory. But instead, they bring him shame, making him seem oppressive, right? Making his ways seem merciless, making him seem like he's not a God of steadfast love. They misrepresent the Lord Almighty. They represent the devil better, honestly. And as those who are supposed to be showing people the Lord, what an insult to him to be showing them Satan while attaching his name. What an insult. We Christians are Christ's representatives on earth. So let's show the world Christ rather than insult his name by showing them Satan and his characteristics. Don't miss the point of Christianity. Oh, you have to keep all these rules. Sure, but why, right? What's the point of keeping the rules? It's because you love God and you love others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two most important commandments. That's your reasoning. That's why you want to keep the rules. And so if a rule forces you into being unloving, if a rule all of a sudden comes into conflict with those laws of love, then don't burden someone with that rule. No, lift the burden that that rule presents. Now, saying that, we really need discernment, right? We really need discernment for this because this can get out of hand depending on our view of what love means. I think we so often have a distorted view of love that makes us think, oh, we have to give this person, you know, whatever they want or like different things like that. It, it's not good. So I want to make sure I'm clear. Love does not mean encourage people to sin, right? Not at all. The exception to God's rules, the exceptions to God's rules, them being exceptions means that they're not sinful, right? Because they're exceptions. That's why they're exceptions. So love is not pushing people to sin. Love is not encouraging people to sin. We still want to honor God and his ways. The New Testament, especially, it gives us Gentiles a lot of clarity on what is sinful for us. And a lot of the world 
they don't see eye to eye with that. And so I want to give an example, for example, and, and this is a, a very difficult example, especially these days. Um, I don't say this lightly, but uh, Paul, in the Bible, in the Word of God, in specifically in 1 Timothy 1.10 and in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, he lists homosexuality as sinful, which for people who are oriented that way, there's very little more difficult for them than not to be able to pursue that person that they love. That's a huge, huge thing to give up. It really is. There are people who would say, I'd rather have that withered hand than to give that up. I'd be in less distress with that withered hand. And we may see their distress in that area. And we might think that, you know, the loving thing to do is tell them that it's okay to pursue that same-sex relationship. But that's not an area where the rule has an exception. Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength means we strive to keep his commands as best we can. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. God's command is that that is something that a person should not do. It's not this broad example that has a number of gray areas in it. No, it's it's his command that that is something a person should not do. They might say, but that rule is a burden to me. That command is a burden. Yeah. But if that is the case, it is a burden that Christ is willing to help them bear. We don't want to encourage people to do what God has called sinful. But I think the bigger point, again, is that sometimes there are, again, circumstances where an exception to the rule that God has presented is not sinful, right? The exception is there. And when that's the case, that's when we pursue that exception. For instance, and I brought this up in February when I talked about uh, divorce. And so let's just say there's a marriage where there's been no adultery. There's been no unbelieving spouse that, you know, has decided to leave. But let's say the spouse is being beaten badly. The Bible's rule on divorce should never be a prison for that spouse to be stuck with their assailant. That's a situation where there can be an exception. But again, we need discernment, right? Because there are definitely a lot of gray areas that come up when we talk about exceptions to the rule, right? We need discernment. We need discernment so bad. So pray for it, right? Pray for discernment when those gray areas come up. We need discernment as well as a heart that truly desires to listen to the word that God has given us and preserved for us over centuries and centuries. There are rules in here that we may not like at all, and I get that. That there, there are rules that may feel to us like absolute burdens. We still have that sinful flesh that wants so much, but... We need to honor God, the God who desires mercy over sacrifice, so much so that rather than having us die as a sacrifice for our own sin like we deserved, he came down as Jesus and became the sacrifice for our sins himself. That's how much he desired mercy. He desired mercy for us so much that he humbled himself to the point of death, even the most humiliating death, being stripped, being scourged, being beaten, being spit on, being mocked. God humbled himself to even that, ultimately being 
crucified, nailed to the cross. Yeah, he desired mercy for us. He did. And if we genuinely believe in him and his death for our sins and his resurrection, then he will have mercy. We will be forgiven of our sin and allowed into heaven after we die to live with him forever in that perfect place. Again, where there are no more tears, where there is no more pain. That's the way of mercy that was made available to us because of Jesus' perfect shed blood on the cross. So, with discernment, because again, we can get it so wrong so often when it comes to especially what love really is. But with discernment, relying on God for discernment, let's not be heartless and blind. Let's stick to the rules, but not to a fault, right? Because there are those rare times where sticking so tightly to the rules becomes sinful itself. When sticking so tightly to the rules makes you break a more important rule, right? Love God. Love your neighbor. So be praying. Be relying on God to give you that discernment so that you don't become like Pharisees, heartless and blind, but also at the same time, so you don't go too far onto the other side and fall deeper into sin. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, you are good to us, and it is amazing, again, especially when we really, really think about your death and your resurrection, how you really, really, really proved that you do desire mercy over sacrifice. That you became the sacrifice instead of having the whole world die, the whole world doomed. You love us. And I thank you so much for that. You are so good in every way. And I just pray that because you've done that for us, that you would give us a heart to follow your word. I know it's hard. I know it's hard and I get that we have the flesh. It is hard to follow your word. It is hard to follow things. Sometimes it's not, and that's very good when it's not, for sure. But there are definitely things that are hard to follow. And I just pray that you would give us a heart, give us a motivation to honor you even then and to trust you that you know what's best and to love you and to love others. In the name of Jesus, give us discernment, Lord. Please, that's what we need, especially in those gray area times because... The Bible says things, but it doesn't always touch on every detail. And especially in this day and age where there's so much that has changed, there's so many different things than the days 2,000 years ago and even beyond when we think of the Old Testament. There's a lot of differences. And so I just pray that you would give us discernment as we come across those gray areas and that we wouldn't stick so closely to the rules that other people would suffer and suffer. And I know we have different definitions of suffer, and, and again, we need discernment for that, because what is suffering, you know? But uh, Lord, just help us, because we need your help, we need your wisdom, and so just be with us and give us that help and wisdom and discernment in the name of Jesus as we continue to walk with you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.